Thank you, Dr. Gearhart. Uh, you're now recognized. Chairman Buchanan, Ranking Member Doggett, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I have been on the faculty at the University of Michigan for 12 years, and I serve as a professor of psychology and the director of the Food and Addiction Science and Treatment Laboratory. I earned my doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Yale University, specializing in addictive disorders, obesity, and disordered eating. Additionally, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist with experience treating individuals with substance use disorders, obesity, and compulsive overeating. Since the 1980s, the United States has witnessed a sharp rise in diet-related diseases. Diabetes rates have doubled, and the prevalence of obesity has tripled. Type 2 diabetes in children, which was almost unheard of in the 1980s, is now projected to quadruple within 40 years. Diet-related cancers are also now increasing, particularly among younger generations. Obesity and diet-related diseases disproportionately affect rural communities and black, Hispanic, and Native Americans, which exacerbates existing health disparities. This public health crisis affects economic viability, workforce productivity, healthcare costs, and military readiness. A significant contributor to the rise of chronic health issues in America is the changing food environment. From the 1980s to the late 2000s, tobacco companies like R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris became the biggest producers of processed food in the world. Internal tobacco industry documents demonstrate strategies designed to develop and sell cigarettes were applied to processed foods and beverages, such as adding flavor additives developed for cigarettes into children's sugar-sweetened beverages, and intentionally targeting children and racial ethnic communities in their marketing. Consequently, the modern food supply has been significantly shaped by the tobacco industry's expertise and maximizing profits from highly appealing products. The result has been an American food environment dominated by ultra-processed foods and beverages that have been optimized to maximize palatability and consumer appeal. These products are industrial formulations with high levels of added sugar, saturated fats, and additives that enhance taste and texture while reducing sensitivity to satiety signals. Common examples include candy, sugar-sweetened beverages, frozen pizza, and salty snacks. The average American now consumes over 57% of their calories from ultra-processed products, and this is even higher in youth. Introduction of these ultra-processed products has displaced nutrient-rich, minimally processed foods, contributing to poor physical, mental, and cognitive health. Many of these ultra-processed products share characteristics similar to recognized addictive substances. They deliver unnaturally high doses of rapidly absorbed carbohydrates and fats, effectively triggering reward mechanisms in the brain. Research shows that sugar, fat, and ultra-processed foods can activate the brain's reward system at similar magnitudes as nicotine and ethanol. These products, enhanced with additives and coupled with texture and flavor modifications, resemble addictive substances like cigarettes, making them difficult to resist despite harmful health consequences. More than 280 studies estimate that 14% of adults and 12% of children would meet the criteria for an addictive disorder based on their intake of ultra-processed foods. This prevalence is doubled in individuals with obesity. If addictive mechanisms are being triggered by ultra-processed foods, this may be an overlooked reason why it can be challenging to reduce their intake, even in the face of life-threatening health conditions like diabetes. A participant in my lab described her ultra-processed food addiction in the following way. I can't even be in the same vicinity as a donut store or any type of donuts because I will finish a dozen all by myself, and I'm a type 2 diabetic, so that could kill me. And I know that, and I know that I shouldn't be eating all those. I shouldn't be eating one, let alone a whole dozen, but for some reason, I just can't stop. A multi-pronged strategy is necessary to reduce excessive intake of ultra-processed products and improve American health. First, evidence-based strategies that have been successful and could be considered on a broader level include taxes on ultra-processed food and beverages and front-of-pack nutritional and warning labels. Second, restricting misleading health claims and marketing of unhealthy products to children, especially on social media, is another important strategy to reduce the risk of diet-related disease in children. 
Third, policies should aim to make healthy, minimally processed foods convenient and affordable, particularly for economically disadvantaged groups who face the greatest challenges. Lastly, investment in scientific research on the health impacts of ultra-processed foods is essential, alongside preventative measures focused on youth to promote lifelong, healthier eating habits. In conclusion, the food and beverage industries have designed many ultra-processed products to be nearly irresistible, leading to rising chronic disease levels and significant public health costs. It is crucial that we address systematic factors contributing to these issues and invest in strategies that promote healthier eating habits and health for all. Thank you.